Welcome to this Gestalt IT Roundtable discussion. This episode is brought to you by Gestalt IT and Micron. Each of our roundtable discussions brings to you a topic that's of interest to the enterprise IT practitioner. Before we dive into today's topic, let's meet our panelists. So hi, my name is Robert Bielby. I'm responsible for automotive system architecture for Micron. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. We have an amazing set of panelists. I'm very privileged to uh, be part of this and um, looking forward to an outstanding discussion. Hi, I'm Grayson Brulte, co-founder and president of Brulte and Company, host of the Road to Autonomy podcast and host of the SAE Tomorrow Today podcast. Hello, I'm Nick DeFiore. I'm the general manager of the automotive group at Seeing Machines, uh, an AI vision uh, company, and um, I'm pleased to be here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Andrew Green. I'm a networking and security research analyst with Gigaom, and I'm also the co-owner of Precisum, where we deliver technical content writing services for enterprise IT. And I'm Stephen Foskett, organizer of Tech Field Day and publisher of Gestalt IT. My focus is on storage and artificial intelligence, and I'm the host of the Utilizing AI podcast. So today's discussion is going to focus on the transformation of autonomous vehicles. We're gonna focus mostly on the applications that are making mobility safer, faster, more efficient, and more enjoyable for everyone. Although most of the focus on advanced driver assistance systems has been on autonomous driving, in-vehicle systems are much more widespread and relevant to drivers and to buyers. From driver monitoring systems to in-car entertainment, technology is coming into the vehicle. Let's start with a look at the various ways that AI is being used inside the vehicle. And Nick, let me start with you, since this is pretty much what you focus on. Yes, we do at Seeing Machine. So um, we're really focused on uh, vision AI and uh, interaction with humans, um, really in the sense allowing computers to uh, see, understand, and assist people. And our, our application inside the vehicle is first and foremost really about saving lives and safety. And um, we view kind of cameras moving to the interior of the vehicle as kind of the final latest frontier. Obviously, we've had cameras outside the vehicle for a very long time. Um, but inside the vehicle, um, there's a whole another kind of ADAS, I'll call it, level, um, as well as uh, we know, and it's pretty much, I think, understood in the industry now that for for safe level uh, two to level four, you know, automated driving, um, there's this really critical um, interaction between the driver and the vehicle, especially in handoffs. And uh, again, driver monitoring there is, uh, is, is very critical. On the ADAS side, uh, the primary focus, and we're seeing this as a focus by regulators as well now, is really trying to conquer this problem of uh, distracted driving and uh, impaired driving, um, starting with drowsiness, um, but moving into other forms of impairment, alcohol, uh, drugs, et cetera. And so that's, uh, that's really the initial push. Um, I think what we're gonna see though, uh, uh, due to economics is also a push into really uh, leveraging the technology for uh, communication, comfort, um, and convenience functions, anything from advanced HMIs um, to um, supporting new 3D types of displays, um, uh, 3D HUDs, uh, HUDs up displays, which all require uh, really uh, tracking of the, the, the face and eyes, knowing where the head position uh, is in the vehicle, as, as well as other uh, convenience features that will be based on really understanding uh, the driver's uh, emotional state, uh, being able to look at expressions, being able to have the driver interact with the system with shakes and nods and hand gestures. Um, so all of this is, gonna, is going to really uh, heighten the vehicle experience and allow the OEMs, uh, vehicle OEMs, to really uh, develop a, a rich set of features that they can charge premium pricing for to really cover their costs of these critical safety safety elements of the system. It's interesting when you, you take driver monitoring in your traditional sense, where if you have a like a level two or level three vehicle, the driver still has to be engaged, but sometimes we've seen in media reports, they're not engaged. So you're gonna save a lot of lives by putting that system in there. 
But lo looking forward as you get to say a, a level three or level four system, I think it's really interesting if you look at somebody's potentially having a cardiovascular issue, no, commonly known as a heart attack. Could the vehicle come to a safe stop if it's fully autonomous? Can it drive an individual to a hospital and notify the hospital? We have an inbound patient with potential cardiac. You could potentially save the lives of the individuals in the vehicle, but not only the individual in the vehicle, the individual is possibly on a bicycle, the individual's walking if that driver becomes unconscious and loses control of that vehicle. Then as we go into the summer months, the other interesting opportunity is it's a horrible statistic, but NHTSA publishes every year of kids that perish in vehicles from the heat when parents leave them there. If you have a driver monitoring system, they can say, okay, there is a young child in there. Nobody's responding, notify local law enforcement or the local fire department. That could save a lot of lives. I think it's really interesting when you just look at how many lives can be saved from putting in your system, not just from a driving perspective, from an overall passenger ecosystem perspective. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I'll, I'll just say that we're, we're also seeing regulators get involved in this, right? Uh, your, your ONCAP, for example, is very focused. They call it sudden sickness. It's really trying to detect incapacitation uh, of a driver. And so they've, they've actually set some, some early standards for that. And we see the OEMs, uh, the OEMs responding uh, with their plans. And, and then we're also starting to see the early signs of moves towards multiple cameras and multiple sensors, sometimes not only cameras, sometimes moving into interior radar sensors to be able to monitor this whole cabin. So I can see a child, you know, maybe not in view of the driver monitoring camera, of course, but maybe even tucked behind a rear seat or, you know, uh, hidden, hidden uh, in a footwell, uh, for example. So I think the sensor suite's going to going to expand within the vehicle uh, to, to really address those those use cases, Grayson. Hey, hey, Nick, I, I, you're the man of the hour, so you're going to be the guy that's going to get all the tough questions. But uh, first of all, it, as a Micron, it's an absolute pr privilege and pleasure to be part of this industry transformation. Um, but um, I've seen some stats, and I'd rather rely on you to maybe give these stats as to just what the impact is with regards to driver monitoring system. I mean, I've heard that like um, the majority of the accidents that occur are due to driver negligence, distraction, et cetera, et cetera. And now with texting and this and that and the other, the situation's only getting worse. Uh, while we're building more ADAS, putting more ADAS in the car, that's being offset by the fact that we've got more distractions that are taking our attention away from the road. I mean, can you give some stats. I mean, this, yeah, is, look, this look, is a pretty profound technology, right? Yeah, look, it, it really is. And and this is why regulators are, are focusing on it now. I, I've seen various reports and statistics, right? But yep. but but some, some of the numbers are up to, you know, the 98% uh, range yep. of accidents now. They're, it's really about human error, right? Yep. And yep. while through law enforcement, we've really managed to reduce quite significantly you know, a lot of the accidents around um, impaired driving due to alcohol, um, uh, some of that due to distraction, trying to outlaw cell phone use uh, that's not hands-free, et cetera. It's still pretty pervasive, as we all know, and we're all, we're all guilty of it to some extent. We all know yeah. from our personal experiences, we get distracted in the car, and um, this is why the initial focus is there. If you, if you combine distraction and you combine accidents due to fatigue or drowsiness, um, it's the, it, it's in the high nineties, right. Yep. In terms of the yep. cause. So the, so if you can start to crush that, you know, really bring that down, it has a, it has a huge in fact, impact. Uh, we're yep. talking about saving, you know, tens of thousands uh, of, of lives per year easily. Right now. Yeah. And this is, this is why this is such an exciting topic and exciting to have you guys at the, uh, at the helm here. I mean, I know you guys are kind of the leader, not kind of the leader in this space and been focusing on this for some time, but uh, this is one of the maybe unsung heroes of the technology that's really going to have a profound effect. Um, and we should be, we should all be pushing for this today to become an industry mandate, uh, given, given the fact that it has such an impact on, um, you know, again, affecting the safety of the, of the passenger and the driver. And we don't have to get to level four, level five, up, 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 up to, um, to see the benefits of this. If we just push for driver monitoring system, we're all gonna benefit significantly 
uh, from the benefits that it, it brings to the table. It really seems to me like those uh, uh, AI technologies and computer vision specifically, besides driver profiling, should also be available out of the box. Uh, so whenever you have new drivers or you have a car rental or even you know test driving, that you can have those safety features on. I think one as aspect that's being often overlooked is the data labeling of it. Uh, so data labeling essentially is the amount of labeled information you can feed into a supervised learning um, computer vision algorithm. So you can actually tell the difference. Um, how does a person that has dry eyes um, behave and look like compared to somebody who's uh, uh, sleepy? Um, and it, in terms of the, the car having some sort of action, such, such as you know perhaps blowing cold air in uh, uh, somebody's face when, uh, when they're sleepy, you wouldn't want that to somebody who has dry eyes. So it's, it really would make a difference to have a lot of labeled data that can make sure you can actually um, understand and represent gestures and facial expressions and everything like that. And the ultimate goal, we talk about it a lot at, at Seeing Machines, is really to have cars understand the people, the driver first and foremost, but then eventually also focus on occupants well enough to be, I'll call it empathetic and uh, to support the well-being of those in the, in the vehicle cabin. And that's kind of, you're alluding to that uh, a little bit, Andrew, and that is the ultimate goal here really for us at least. Yeah. So let's, uh, think about this a little bit more in detail and what this technology is capable of. Because as I said at the start, most people, if you talk about ADAS and if you talk about uh, driver assistance technology and machine learning and cameras and sensors, they immediately jump to autonomous driving. That's all they think about. How can this car drive itself? Yep. But that's really not the whole picture. And in fact, that's not even maybe the biggest picture. I think that there are so many exciting things that can be done inside the car. So let's talk about that. How can we build on the technology that is appearing into the vehicles today? Since we have cameras, since we have sensors, since we have advanced computers and uh, you know, machine learning processors and that sort of thing, how can these be used to help drivers to make drivers enjoy driving more, enjoy their experience more, enjoy the vehicle more, and maybe frankly sell more cars? Um, uh, Grayson, I'd like to throw that to you. I'll keep it very simple, over the air updates. If the software in the vehicle is not updating every day in real time and it's antiquated and you have to go to a dealer and pay a $500 charge to update it, it's a horrible experience. Why not push out the technologies there, push out real time updates, if they then learn the customization profile of the customer. So my wife's iPhone is synced to her profile, my iPhone is synced to my profile, the seat's already set, you don't have to hit the button, the music, the temperature. It should all just be customized. And to get there, we really need over-the-air updates. And then when you have the over-the-air updates, you, you need the memory to make sure the system runs fast. And in the old days, when you have to go like this to open the, uh, the, the panoramic roof, why do you have to do this three and four times? It should just be simple. It's just to say, okay, car, open panoramic roof, and it should go instant. If you want to put your hand up, it should just go. We have to get rid of that lag because it's frustrating. So you're sitting there trying to move your hand this way and that way, and that's distracting. And then you're getting frustrated. This is a horrible experience, but over-the-air updates could fix that. Robert. We've talked in the past, you're doing a great job of optimizing it. How are you optimizing that experience? Yeah, thank you, Grace. And that's a great pitch for uh, Micron and memories and whatnot. So, um, you know, some of the cool stats that uh, we're staring at is today, today's high-end vehicle has about 100 million lines of code. Uh, it's projected to go to 300 million lines of code. And guess where you need to store all that code? That's in memory. And that code had better be 100% accurate. I mean, maybe you can deal with something that's messed up with IVI because you've got a pixel that's screwed up on the screen. But if this is associated with the ADAS, et cetera, et cetera, that's fundamentally unacceptable. So um, we look at 300 million lines of code, that's larger than any other embedded applications, full stop. So it's like 10X larger than Windows, blah, blah, blah. You better believe there's gonna be a need for updates and regular updates. Um, and to that extent, um, you know, again, user, and there's different, types of updates. One update is just, you know, I'm going to refine the software, um, improve the algorithms. And then there's another update, which is to your point, I've got a new passenger, I've got a new occupant, I've got a new driver, 
what is their profile? And I want to be able to update that immediately in the vehicle and again, flawlessly. And again, we're the kind of unsung hero in all of this, but um, it's, it's an important component. So, but let me, let me drop it to uh, Nick. Um, now I'm playing Steve's role, but let me drop it to Nick and uh, hear what he has to say on that. Yeah, well, I guess um, since you're on the memory topic, I mean, it's absolutely true um, the important role memory plays. Uh, it also plays a pretty important role in, in safety. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're, we're having to operate uh, in the safety environment at very, very low latencies and very high, what I'll call availabilities or reliability. Um, you know, if we're trying to track the body, uh, a location, um, position in the seat, um, velocity, if the car is, uh, is uh, coming to a, a, a fast stop or, or uh, Lord forbid, uh, is, is, is colliding uh, with another object, um, those are very uh, low latency functions tracking that to, to understand how to fire an airbag so as to um, um, prevent injuries rather than cause injuries. Um, and the, the, so, so memory, me memory, you know, bandwidth and latency and, and also functional safety, right? Um, you know, me memory integrity is critical, right? It, it doesn't take uh, many data errors to um to prevent you know safe operation to 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 undermine what we're what we're trying to achieve in the first place and so um pretty pretty critical pretty critical element uh in the in the picture and and so i i don't want to i mean i really want to get back to driver monitoring system and such but i do want to make a little bit of a uh give a little bit of insight on the you know safety side of things and there really are two aspects of it. One is the systematic fault coverage, which says you're designing your part to the best in class capabilities. And um, one of the things that's been interesting is that when ISO 26262, I love to throw all these acronyms around, but uh, when the industry uh, started to look at safety of electronics and so on and so forth, um, there really was kind of a uh, mis misperception or a uh, simplification of what the complexity of memory is but so they they classified it as like a class two technology which is kind of on the line of diodes and really kind of more simplistic products but when you peel the onion back a layer on both dram and storage it's really really complex and it's not a class two product it's a class three product we've recognized this we've made investments in um, ensuring that we're designing our products to best in class methodology so that there are no systematic errors that occur. And uh, so we support systematic ASLD, which is the most stringent um, spec. But then at the end of the day, there is the realization that with all electronics, there is a potential for failure due to random events, blah, 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 blah. This is called random fault coverage. And in this case, the what's important is to, you know, at some point we do everything that we can to avoid it. But then if it happens, the trick is how do you detect that it's happened? And so if you have like a row column decoder that has failed, you want to be able to flag that and detect that. And then we can pass that information on to you, Nick, and you can decide, okay, is this something that I need to be concerned with? Or is this something that, okay, it's just one pixel on a screen, I don't care. And by providing you this information, you can decide, do I take the car and cripple it and roll it off to the side of the road, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I increasingly, I mean, as you are directly in the front lines of safety, memory is now also taking on a very important role in helping to support the efforts that you have in terms of achieving your objectives. Sorry yeah, for I, I, I agree. And it's really addressed at the system level as well. The yep. memory is yep. one element. And yep. uh, as you said, random failures can occur everywhere. And, yep. um, and, and so you have to design a system uh, that, that, that's robust. So the, the, the better the memory is, the easier our job is, but it, yep. it, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop there. It's, it's really, and in some cases, actually using AI to yep. be able to detect uh, and be able to deal deal with those with those types of errors.
So one of the things that occurs to me, though, is that uh, this technology isn't just about safety. It's also about uh, usability. So as uh, Grayson was talking uh, before about uh, augmented reality and in-car, in-vehicle controls, there is nothing more frustrating than a supposedly useful control that is so slow that it's basically unusable. As you, as you said, you know, I mean, my, my car has voice response. Every, every car has that now. But uh, half the time, those systems are slow and unreliable. Uh, the same with a lot of these uh, sort of uh, haptic systems that they'll have now where, you, as you said, you, you have to wave your hand or something like that, and it just doesn't work. So my, my question to you is, how do we improve those systems and how do we make these cars really attractive? Because in-vehicle technology is going to be the big selling point for the next generation of cars, as we've seen with uh, cars coming out of uh, companies like Mercedes and Tesla that have these amazing in-vehicle systems. How do we make those cars uh, really moving forward uh, more attractive to buyers? When you achieve full autonomy where there's, there's no steering wheel, there's no pedals, the front windshield, your side windshield are gonna become augmented and it's gonna become a world. And that's gonna be fun. So you're gonna have this incredible experience where you'll be able to play, if you wanna play a virtual video game or if you wanna go shopping, it's going to be an entire e-commerce world. And the really interesting thing for the automotive companies is you're going to have a commerce layer on top of that that's going to live on top of it. You're going to be able to shop from the vehicle, be able to do things and experience new things. If you want to go travel, you say, okay, car, I'd like to go pick strawberries. And the car will take you to a strawberry thing. Okay, the strawberry picking is $19.99. Okay, car, yes to charge. Because if you eliminate that friction from having to take out a credit card and you augment it, now you have this whole entire experience. Or if you're taking a child to an amusement park, perhaps the car could be augmented for that amusement park you're going to. That's going to be really fun when, when, you, when, the, when there is no pedals and there is no steering wheel, the driver does not have to pay attention whatsoever. That the inside of that vehicle is going to become your living room on steroids. And that's really where it's going to be fun. But in order for that to happen, it has to be fast. It can't be trying to move things around. Oh, that's not moving. Oh, that's buggy. Oh, that's glitchy. It, it has to function where the the individual doesn't have to think about it. I think as you get into the vehicles and we go into the future, an individual's not going to want to wear a VR headset. They're going to want to just look at the glass and be able to move things. And that's really where it's going. And it's really interesting. So if you take what Nick's working on at Seeing Machines, then you could take the passenger and you pressure moves like this, passenger moves like that. Perhaps there's some sort of reaction in, in that augmented reality environment. That to me is going to be really fun. Nick, are you seeing any of that from any internal research that you're doing at Seeing Machines? We are, and we're not just seeing it from internal research, we're seeing it in terms of understanding our customer, you know, and our customer's customer, ultimately the OEMs, uh, we play kind of a tier two role in automotive, um, really putting this kind of thing on their, on, on, on their roadmaps, you know, it's, it's not starting out as, you know, uh, obviously, you know, all the windows, you know, being, being screens, um, we're not, we're not there yet, but in terms of, you know, 3D displays and augmented uh, reality HUDs that, that, that require this real-time tracking. In, in fact, we've got one customer um, um, who's implemented a 3D display that uses our, our eye tracking and the latency between the eye tracking and the system controlling this display has to be less than eight milliseconds, right? And so you've gotta be able to track reliably every time um, and 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 stay synchronized um and so yeah that that actually is an example of where we're we're actually developing the 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 technologies the implementations you know how to use processing how to use memory that that's what's going to lead that example is is where we're building the skills i think and building the capability in the industry to get to, to to what you to what you described because you're spot on. If that consumer has to wait or it's not working, they're going. Oh, I'm not using your service anymore. Yeah. That's the. It's going to all collapse. Yeah. No. Yeah. People. People want the same digital experience that they have with their cell phone in their home in the vehicle. Otherwise, it's not going to be acceptable. But I, I have to admit, Grayson, you're a glass half full guy. I'm a glass half empty guy. And uh, the problem that I see is that um, while you're talking about all these wonderful user experiences, what I see is that the last, the last bastion of where you could not work because you're driving is now going to be the place that you were expected to work. So you better figure out how to get PowerPoint in the car and Word and whatever, because 
you're going to be creating foils as you're being driven down the road. You're not going to be, yeah, 10% of the time you'll be taking your kid to a cool event or whatever, but uh, it's all, it's all, it's all good stuff, right? That's what we have the do not disturb focus button. I'm ah, sorry. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think cars, I think these future cars will need a special uh, Zoom video conferencing function, given the number of people that I talk to while they're in their car. Yeah. So another aspect that occurs to me, though, with these systems is that, uh, you know, it's not all about the car. It's also about the cloud. So vehicles have become, as we just mentioned, uh, another client endpoint, another client device. And um, increasingly, uh, the vehicle is an edge computing device along with being, well, a vehicle. Um, as mobile devices, though, we have to consider how are these things going to handle connectivity? How are they going to connect? You know, how are they going to use technologies like 5G? How will they interact with cloud services, given the fact that there, is it just a reality that there's going to be some uh, disconnection and, and latency and so on? And um, how are we going to protect data? How do we make sure that this all functions in, uh, going forward? So uh, let me put that to uh, Andrew. Um, how does a modern vehicle function in a connected world? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. So obviously, vehicles are part of the wider IoT ecosystem. And I think compared to other devices, IoT devices, they, they got a really privileged position for space power and cooling, which means that you can have compute storage and then also high intensity, high intensity connectivity in the car. Now, in terms of what you do with the connectivity, typically you would want to leverage mobile networks and specifically 5G. And 5G um, has this technology is called massive MIMO or massive multiple input, multiple output, uh, which means that on a single mass, on a single antenna, you can have much many more connected devices compared to like 4G, 3G. Um, the other thing that needs to be considered with 5G is that because it's using um, pretty pretty short wavelengths, uh, it's got shorter range and also um, it doesn't have um, line of sight penetration just like 2G would do, for example. So you might be in a car and you're stuck behind a truck or in a tunnel and you wouldn't be able to access the, the, the 5G network. So it would really be important to make sure that 5G connectivity, um, if the car relies on it, it's uh, um, widespread. And then you can also have uh, other technologies such as small cells in, in places such as in parking lots and whatever, uh, where you would need that to have that connectivity. Uh, for the edge, I think the most important uh, way of thinking about the edge is in terms of milliseconds rather than the topological edge of the network. Um, I usually define it as anything with the edge below 20 milliseconds round trip. And the reason for 20 milliseconds is because that's the point when you can actually tell there's a difference between what you're doing as a user and then the feedback that you're getting. So for example, if you're playing a musical instrument and you have more than 20 milliseconds uh, delay, then you are not able to play. It just feels awkward. It, it feels jittery. Um, so between 5G and the edge, you can typically have computing on the on the mast, on the antenna. Uh, and at that point, you can have pretty, pretty good um, power and um, enough processing power to have programming language to support routing and connectivity between cars. So you can have, uh, you, rather than just being connected to the cloud and you, ha you can have your uh, perhaps uh, data analysis tool on there, you can actually have routing directly on the mast to a different car. So you can become in this uh, kind of mesh of connected cars that are constantly aware of each other. But this also has some implications about real-time processing and the data streams and everything is going to be very intensive, both from um, a, um, connectivity, speed, bandwidth, throughput, pretty much everything. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, and so we're touching on another technology that it's very exciting as well that really demands the kind of the connectivity and the low latency, CV to X, et cetera. And uh, if I were to point to the two technologies that I think are gonna really transform the safety of the vehicle, I think it's really driver monitoring system and CV to X, I think, and I'm speaking for Nick now and I'll let Nick weigh in, but I think, from a 5G connectivity standpoint, 
from a, a driver monitoring system, this the, the cloud has a different role in terms of um, what it brings to the table in, in terms of driver monitoring, because it really requires, driver monitoring requires real-time processing, uh, but then at some point you can collect data and stats over time and process that kind of stuff in the cloud. Um, and so it's latency and all that kind of good stuff. This is again, a pitch for memory. I wanna store all this information so that when I do when I am at a point where I'm well connected, I can upload all this stuff to the cloud and the processing in the cloud can do the analytics and analysis and improve algorithms and store the, uh, the personality of the driver, so on and so forth. But this is probably a more, I'm, I'm speaking now for Nick, so I apologize if I'm putting words in your mouth, Nick. No, not, a, not at all. I, I, I think that's right. I think, um, there's certainly um, a set of functions that are going to remain, you know, deeply embedded, um, you know, at the edge. And that deals uh, for sure with real time, you know, safety. I, I would say in general, the sensing, you know, there's kind of sensing and there's perception, right? Yep. The sensing side is going to stay rooted uh, deeply embedded at the edge because the, 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 the amount of data and the fact that it has availability, right, has to be 100%, right? And um, and so, and the amount of data, the set, number of sensors are growing, as I mentioned, the resolution of sensors are growing, the frame rates are very high, right? You can't miss the blink of an eye. You know, I talked about, for instance, um, this kinematic, you know, uh, you know, body position dynamics, um, that that's very real time sensing so that that's going to stay in the car i think a lot of perception uh, may end up staying in the car um some of it maybe for security reasons or we're doing you know um driver and passenger identification uh for example um both for convenience features you know you want to be able to set the set the um know who's in the driver's seat to, to maybe set the you know have the profile of the driver and you know seat positions and things like that um but, but also identifying occupants also for the purposes of, you know, transactions, you want to complete a credit card transaction or buy while you're driving, you need to know, you know, you need to know who that person is uh, to authorize, a, you know, to authorize a transaction. So we're seeing demand for this kind of thing. So a lot of those types of uh, things will stay, will stay embedded. Um, I think you know, you mentioned kind of alluded to this, this idea that um, some perception, though, is very complex in its long term, you know, if I'm trying to understand what's normal about Robert, you know, how does Robert drive, you know, how, what's Robert's normal behavior for being alert, normal behavior for being tired or fatigued. Um, that can be very important. Um, that's that that can be a heavy lift. The profile over time might make sense in the cloud. Five G could certainly enable that. Um, and and knowing that you know, knowing that something isn't right with Robert because Robert doesn't normally behave this way can be can be very valuable uh, in terms of of um, of safety and and comfort. Again, we want the cars to become empathetic. They need to know. Uh, they need to know if you're not yourself. Um, uh, as, an, as an example. Yeah, and I think that that's the ultimate future that we're looking at here is to have cars that are not just uh, self-driving, but also that are an extension of ourselves that uh, fit into our lives, that uh, enable us to do things that we could not otherwise do, that feel natural and that feel like they're truly following us. I mean, I'm certain that that's what I want. I want my car to adapt to me rather than uh, having it be just sort of a, an appliance that I'm using. And, and I hope that that's the direction that we're heading with the technology. So I wanna thank our friends from Micron and Seeing Machines for joining us along with uh, Andrew and Grayson as well. And um, Robert, where can we uh, go to learn more about this and other information about Micron's involvement? I would just say go to uh, www.micron.com and uh, look at automotive, um, you know, just uh, look at Micron. We've got a bunch of blogs and videos that cover a lot of these different topics, uh, ranging from, again, driver monitoring through CV to X, um, the role of storage, memory, et cetera, uh, functional safety, 
uh, just go to micron.com and look at look at our automotive link and we've got just a whole lot of materials and uh, a lot of fun interviews with uh, Grayson himself as well. And uh, I think we uh, have those the links posted to our website as well. But just go to micron.com and and you'll you'll learn everything you want to know and more. Thank you. Um, and then Andrew, Nick, and Grayson, uh, where can we connect with you and follow your thoughts on this? So you can uh, you can find me at precisem.co. So that's P R E C I S M or on LinkedIn for Precisem. Uh, same for me. Uh, you, you can find me. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I've got a public profile there. And uh, if you want to find out more about what we're doing at Seeing Machines, SeeingMachines.com. You can also probably connect with me uh, there if you leave a message uh, at SeeingMachines.com. Uh, you can also follow me on LinkedIn and then I'm on Twitter at G B R U L T E. Thanks, and we'll put these links in the show notes as well. And as for me, you can find me at Gestalt IT and on the Utilizing AI podcast. So thank you, Robert, and the rest of you uh, for being part of this recording. Uh, and thank you for our community members for tuning in. If you want more great dis technology discussions like this, please visit Gestalt IT or find our YouTube channel, which is Gestalt IT Video.